documentary that was shown here in Columbia last night. In case you missed it last night, you will have the link to be able to review it at a later time. And she'll put that on when she gets a moment. Now, I'll say up front, we have a bad thunderstorm coming through Columbia right now. So hopefully um, our internet will not be All affected. Right, I have an appointment that I want for my second shot. All right. Oh, it's blocked the existing stuff on the flatback. It's actually going to go somewhere else. I'm sorry. I feel like I fell off. I fell off. What did I do? Okay, everyone, um, I'm going to start the program now. Uh, again, let me remind you to please make sure you're on mute during the program. And I want to welcome you all. Um, my name is Lily Filler, and I'm president of the South Carolina no, let's start again here because I've got a lot of South Carolina Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. <laughs> And it is with enormous pleasure that I welcome you to an eye-opening discussion about the book, Unexampled Courage, which was the basis of PBS special last night, The Blinding of Isaac Woodard. The link to the PBS program has been typed into the chat or will be shortly for those of you that would like to review it again. Tonight is a very special program for the society since the author of the above mentioned book was written by our friend, our colleague and a past president of the society, the Honorable Richard Gurgle. For those of you who were able to view PBS American Experience series last night, you can now understand how important, how historically significant, and how inspirational the story was. Now, I, um, Susan, Lori, please mute yourself. I hear dogs barking. I thought I had. Okay, so everyone just double check again, that's fine. Before we begin, I would like to introduce and thank our Society Executive Director, Rachel Barnett. Give a shout out, Rachel. There she is. Um, this program will be recorded, so I ask that you remain muted during the entirety of the program. If time permits, and we'll make sure it does, we will entertain questions at the end of the program. Please type them into the chat room and send them to me, Lily Filler, and I will be sure that the guests receive them. Accompanying Judge Gurgle this evening will be South Carolina historian, Dr. Pat Sullivan and director and producer, Jamila Efron. And of course, another one of our society members and past president, Attorney Robert Rosen will be the moderator of this program. I will now turn the program over to Robert who will introduce our guests. Robert, take it away. Thank you, Lily. Um, this is really a great thrill for me because I get to be the moderator and I don't have to um, share that with Richard Gurgle. So, you know, really this is uh, just a wonderful event for me personally. Um, um, our program today will discuss the PBS documentary the Blinding of Isaac Woodard, which was broadcast last evening by PBS and the book upon which the film was based, Unexampled Courage, uh, The Blinding of Sarge Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Awakening of President Harry S. Truman and Judge Wade is Wearing, which was written by, by my ordinarily my co-host, Richard Gurgle. And you know, we do show and tell on our program. We have such high tech. So this is the book that Richard wrote. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, I want to introduce uh, Jamila Efron. Uh, yes, she is uh, somehow related to Nora Efron, but we, we, we can't go into too much detail on that. Um, she was the director and producer of The Blinding of Isaac Woodard. She's been producing and directing documentary films for more than 15 years. Her most recent film was George W. Bush, which premiered on American Experience in May of 2020. Her previous film, Woodstock, Three Days That Defined a Generation, was released by PBS. Um, she's also produced and co-directed uh, Far From the Tree, based on the best-selling book. Additional work for American Experience includes uh, Milai, The Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, 
Clinton and, and others. So she um, has had quite a career. Um, also with us tonight is Dr. Patricia Sullivan, uh, who's a renowned historian of uh, modern American history. Her book, Lift Every Voice, the NAACP and the making of the civil rights movement is considered the definitive history of the NAACP. She's written numerous other books on the American civil rights movement and has recently completed her much awaited book. And this is really high tech, Robert Kennedy's America in black and white. So there's the cover. It's a, and it's a book about Bobby Kennedy that will be coming out soon. And our third guest is the Honorable Richard Gurgle, um, who I would say needs no introduction, but there are probably people on the program who don't know that he was born and raised in Columbia, um, that he has a and don't care degree. and probably don't care. <laughs> <laughs> he has a bachelor's degree from Duke. He apparently couldn't get into UVA, but look, you know, UVA is not for everybody. Um, and uh, has a Juris Doctor from Duke University School of Law. He practiced law from 1979 until he was elected to the United States District Court in 2009. He was nominated by President Obama. And I know you'd be thrilled to know that he had the support of our congressional delegation. Um, he was the presiding judge of uh, the Dylan Roof trial. And of course, he is the author of the book we're talking about tonight. And he is the co-author with Belinda Gurgle of In Pursuit of the Tree of Life, A History of the Early Jews of Columbia, South Carolina. His book was reviewed in the New York Times by David Blight, who is one of the great historians uh, in America. And um, he has nothing but wonderful things to say about it. Uh, he says uh, that Judge Gurgle has written an engrossing history animated by the stories of several key characters. So the book has gotten tremendous reviews, um, well-deserved, a lot of work went into it. Um, I'm going to ask Jamila if she would play um, just a, a, you know, a brief two minute trailer so we can kind of, for those of you who didn't see the film, you get a little taste of what it was like. Absolutely. To a white southerner in 1946, nothing is more provocative than a black man in uniform. He's brought off a bus and he's hit with a blackjack within moments. It just seemed to be something that shouldn't happen in America. No one can say that what happened to Isaac Woodard was justified. This is not a case that the Justice Department wanted to bring. And at trial, they showed that their heart was not in it. Judge Waring was horrified that he was made part of this travesty. He was emerging as the conscience of the South. Woodard's blinding just seemed to encapsulate other cases of violence against African Americans. They thought it was perfectly normal for a Southern sheriff to get away with blinding a black man. The idea that a war veteran could be attacked and beaten by law enforcement officers surprised Truman and enraged him. And then he turns to his staff and says, my God, we have got to do something. Thurgood Marshall and his legal team are becoming very effective at chipping away at the segregation status quo. But he was threatened constantly. His life was always in danger. During a trial, they would have to move him around from house to house. Judge Waring says to Marshall, bring me a frontal challenge to segregation. Marshall's office had files from floor to ceiling of these cases. They are playing for the U.S. Supreme Court. They're building a record for the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has rendered a momentous historic decision. Who would have guessed that the blinding of a heroic veteran would be the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America? Thank you. Richard, how is it you came to write this book? I mean, what, how did you get interested in it? Well, when I, um, you know, when I was um, um, beginning to make this transition from being a private attorney to the United States District Court, 
I became very interested in the history of the court. I was coming to Charleston and um, I was aware there was a fascinating but largely mysterious figure who had been a co- who had been in the same courthouse from 1942 to 1952, Jay Wade is wearing. And I knew he was, had been the, you know, the first of the great Southern civil rights judges. But and the more I read about him, he remained an enigma. The biggest question being, what had changed him? What had transformed him from this Charleston patrician to this civil rights visionary? And um, the more I dug, I became persuaded it was a highly unusual case involving a largely forgotten moment and a largely forgotten incident regarding the blinding of an African-American sergeant on the day of his discharge from from the, from the armed forces, that was Sergeant um, Isaac Woodard. And as I um, um, developed and learned more about this story, um, um, I asked myself, well, how did this case ever get brought? Because in 1946, the Department of Justice was not bringing case against white police officers for using excess force against African-Americans. And that I then discovered that it had been on the direct order of Harry Truman and that he, like Judge Waring, had been deeply moved by this horrible incident. And that they both acted in ways that fundamentally altered the country. Harry Truman um, orders the desegregation of the military, which is a huge moment in American history. Um, it, it's really marking, it's demonstrating that an integrated multicultural institution can work. And then uh, Judge Waring eventually orchestrates, and I think the movie captures it, my book talks about it a lot, basically orchestrates the Supreme Court case that becomes Brown versus Board of Education and provides a great dissent, which becomes the language of Brown. So, you know, once I'd figured that out, I said, I got to tell this story because it was very clear to me that that, that that story had yet, not yet been told. And, um, you know, people ask me, Robert, they say, how did you find time to do it? And I have to say, beats me. I hadn't figured it out yet. <laughs> took me a long time, uh, seven years. I, I did um, spend nights and weekends. Um, Linda had the running joke that um, that we spent all our vacations at the National Archives. Uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan will recognize that. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we, um, we it, it just, you know, it all pulled together. And um, eventually I've had a lot of good fortune and a lot of good support. And the book's gotten a lot of very positive attention. And I was really honored that PBS wanted to do a documentary. And I was blessed to have the great Jamila Efron direct it. Well, you, the story you discovered apparently was lost. I mean, this is not in mainstream civil rights history. So you, you actually had the great good fortune that few historians have of finding a gold nugget. Well, you know, I, it wasn't. It is now. I mean, I'm, I'm flattered by the constant mention of Isaac Woodard. He's getting his due. I understand the Truman Library is um, is adding. The, the library has gone through a major renovation, and they're adding a section now on civil rights based on unexampled courage. And well, um, it's becoming mainstream. It's I'm honored. Well, it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's a great story. So. Uh, J- Jamila, you mind if I call you Jamila? <laughs> I mean, at my age, you know, what attracted you as a documentary filmmaker to this story? I mean, I think it, the fact that it is sort of unknown is always appealing um, when you set out to make a film um, to kind of bring to light something that we all should know about but don't. Um, and also, you know, there's just so much to the story. There's so many small acts of courage that have enormous impacts on history. Um, so digging into that and bringing that to life was was a very fun but daunting challenge for a filmmaker. So, and you made, the, you made it during the pandemic in the last year. We did. Uh, tell us about the challenges of producing the film during a COVID pandemic. Well, I can tell you, um, I don't recommend trying to make a film during a pandemic. Um, it it was it was very difficult. Part of it is is that in in film, you know, so much happens when you sit down with a person for an interview, 
uh, facial expressions, body language, you can really have a dialogue with them. And, you know, we were meant to, I think, start principal photography on the film in mid-April when New York was sort of at the very worst of the, the pandemic. Um, so it felt utterly unsafe to be in the same room with other people. Um, so we had to basically shut the production down until the numbers dropped and, and we sort of could figure out a way to safely do interviews. Uh, they gave me, the, the network gave me the option of doing all Zoom interviews, but I just couldn't, I knew that, that 20 years from now, when I looked at The Blinding of Isaac Woodard and I saw all the Zoom interviews, it wouldn't feel right to me. So I, I wanted to wait until we, we could figure out a way to, to be there in person. Well, the story, as everybody knows, is a tragic, terrible incident of racial violence, but, but it inspired people of all races and backgrounds to speak up and act against the world of Jim Crow. Tell us about some of the people in this story who you came to admire and why? Is that a question for me? For you. So, I mean, obviously Isaac Woodard's just simple act of saying, talk to me like a man, you know, not, not too many people would have the courage to stand up and, and demand the respect that they're owed, especially in the circumstances that he did that, in the place where he did that, the time that he did that. Um, tremendously brave of him and he paid for it. Uh, Judge Waring sort of facing the ostracization that he faced from his community, also so courageous that not a lot of people would, I think, have have the gumption to do, the heart to do. Um, and, you know, we don't have a lot of politicians these days that would risk losing elections the way that Harry Truman did, that, that would be able to sort of shrug off their friends telling them you're going to lose the election if you if you don't drop the civil rights thing um and then of course the briggs plaintiffs the the they're i think for me the the ones who who had the most sustained pressure on them and remained steadfast as they and they just wanted a school bus um that that to me is is really particularly moving of course thurgood marshall's courage also is sort of that that's a film unto itself um, what he endured to do his work. Did, did you did you interview the Briggs family members and some and the Delanes and and what 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 reaction did you have when you were interviewing the actual? Well, these would actually be the children of the of the participants because the 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 actual participants are, are gone. Yeah. So we so, interviewed. Yeah, Reverend Delane's son um, and uh, Nathaniel Briggs, who is the son of, of um, Harry and Eliza Briggs. And, um, you know, they're not young men anymore. Um, and what was really sort of arresting is that they're so in touch with the anger that they have, uh, that they, that over the way their parents were treated over life in Somerton and you know, I think what was so moving was was Nathaniel Briggs saying, you know, I believed that I was subhuman. I actually believed I was subhuman. And it wasn't until he got a bit older and he looked at, I think it was the actual Ken Clark doll studies that made him realize it wasn't just me. It was all of us growing up in this place that internalized this message that we were subhuman and lesser than. And it was just very, very emotional. Jamila, well, let, me, let me just jump in. Tell them about how y'all had, when you came to Charleston to interview uh, Belinda and me, you had to come in separate cars. <laughs> Tell well, about that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm based in, in Brooklyn and uh, my camera man is based in Boston and we needed to sort of, we needed to stop in Washington DC, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, um, and ultimately Massachusetts. But I just, I wouldn't, I did not want anyone to board a plane before sitting in a room with any of our interviewees. So we, 
I convinced uh, the camera operator to caravan. So we each rented our own cars and drove, <laughs> took a long road trip through the, through the South. Well, at least you got to see south of the border. So that was probably the highlight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pat, Pat um, many have dated the beginning of the modern civil rights movement to the murder of Emmett Till or Dr. King, King's Montgomery bus boycott. But this film and your work detailing the history of the NAACP show that the seeds of the modern civil rights movement date before World War II and the years immediately following World War II. Can you tell us about that? Because this audience, I mean, most people don't really realize all that. You, maybe you could tell us who Emmett Till was and how, where did the civil rights movement really get started? Oh, that's a question historians <laughs> are continuing to debate and um, <laughs> wonder about. But, but I think the brilliance of, of um, Richard's book and the, the amazing film that Jamila made is that it really opens up this period in a way that helps us understand that this was a, a transitional time, World War II and the immediate post-war period. And um, much that went into it, I mean, the NAACP and the whole legal struggle, you know, Marshall had courage, he also had brilliance. He was one of the most brilliant constitutional lawyers and he was someone who went into the field and worked with these communities, you know, lived with these communities throughout the South and really helped to, he and his, his uh, small team of lawyers, uh, starting in the mid 1930s with Charles Houston being their, their leader, um, beginning to develop the legal strategy and organizing strategy that would overturn Jim Crow. And when you have that moving forward and then you have World War II a hundred, I mean, a million African-American men and women served in World War II. And uh, as one of the veterans who came back, a man named William Bailey to Bogalusa, Louisiana, he said, I know the price they had paid. If I could go there and make sacrifice and sacrifice, uh, make sacrifice with my life, I was willing to do it here. So that sort of spirit comes back uh, after the war and and also at that time, I just have to mention this, this one case, which helps explain the white Southern fear. The NACP won a major legal case in 1944, overturning the all white primary, which meant that African-Americans, that was a, the biggest impediment to black voting. And it really opened up the possibility for significant black voting. And you have veterans coming back ready to seize that opportunity. So that is a potent mix. Um, that you have by the time we get to 1946 and Isaac Woodard boards that bus with his uniform on, determined not that as, as Jamila said so beautifully, I am a man. So it, it's, a, it's an explosive mix, but it's in the context of a movement that has already established a foundation in the South around legal struggle and around these communities um, like Somerton and, and many other communities around the South. You know, one of the things that shocked me about the film, and, you know, a lot of us have read about it and think we know things, but, you know, the, all these murders that happened in 1946, I mean, it's, it's like no one, I mean, the average American just doesn't have any idea what happened. Can you, can you tell everybody about the year 1946? Yeah, just like a brief overview. Um... You had the Columbia, Tennessee race riot, which was broke out when a black and white veteran fought over the veteran, the black veteran's mother being insulted. And, and you know, the, the black part of it, Columbia was invaded and just tore up. Um, you had, again, 1946 was a midterm election year. So there was the issue of people voting in the primaries. Um, Medgar Evers, the great civil rights leader, soldier just back, he and his brother go to, to vote in a primary, and they're met with gun-wielding mob at the at the polling booth, and so they turn away. Um, you have a case in Georgia where Talmadge warns uh, Herman Talmadge that you know if you don't stop you know blacks from voting in the primary, we won't have a white government. And in the context of that heated primary, um, and I think this is mentioned in the film, a former a serviceman and his wife and his brother-in-law and wife are executed 
after an altercation with the landlord. So there are just numerous instances like this uh, throughout 1946, uh, showing again, this black courage and determination and this really determined white resistance. So, and, let me, and let me just add, Robert, about the rule of law. Um, you know, there are thousands of, of lynchings, uh, mostly African-Americans, mostly in the South. And there's not one successful prosecution, not one. There's no accountability. In fact, as the, as the film noted, in many instances, law enforcement officers are at the lynchings. And so you have this complete breakdown of the rule of law. Um, and this is a kind of crisis in which, um, and, and, uh, and you know, one of, the, one of the struggles that Harry Truman faced, one of the many pressures on him, uh, was that we were in this international emerging battle with the Soviet Union over uh, world influence. And many of the places which we were most sensitive about um, were, um, were in, the, in Asia and in Africa, which were people of color. And you know, how did it look? And believe me, the Soviet Union was promoting this story. How did it look when we were having lynchings that when no one was accounted for? We had a blinding of a African-American soldier on the day he was discharged. And Truman was being tell, told by his, dip, his diplomatic leadership in the State Department, this is, a, this is an international disaster for the United States. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. So, so Pat, why was the blinding of Sergeant Woodard such an important moment in American history, in your opinion? Well, again, as, as is brilliantly laid out in, in the book and the film, it's this convergence, right? You have it's a black soldier who's blinded. Uh, he makes his way to New York and to the office of Walter White. Uh, they are ready to mobilize around this issue, organize around this issue. And, and again, the characters who come into play, Orson Welles with his radio uh, program, trying to identify who, who did this, who blinded Isaac Woodard. Um, so it just sort of becomes a symbol of these other atrocities that are happening uh, against uh, black veterans during this particular year. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it gets tremendous publicity. I mean, that scene in the film where you have 20,000 people in the stadium in Harlem, uh, how much money did they raise? $10,000. $10,000 to uh, support anti-mob activity and to help support Isaac Woodard. It, it was sort of the, the spark. Kind of, you think of the sit-ins in 1960. You know, Isaac Woodard was a spark that opened all of this up. And, uh, and again, as pointed out in the film, wearing his involvement and then Marshall bringing these cases and how that folds over into the Briggs case in an important way. So. And, and, and the thing that I just can't understand, and maybe you could briefly address this is, if this story was so important, and it seems like it was, I mean, Orson Welles was, you know, an internationally known celebrity, and all of these people were fired up about this. Um, why is this story, I mean, what happened to this story? Why, why isn't it in the histories of the civil rights movement until Richard rescued it basically from oblivion, really? Well, one thing, again, that Richard demonstrates brilliantly in the book is that this report, I mean, this story was reported on in the African-American press. It was headlines in the African-American press. If you look back at, you know, sort of white media, they might have mentioned it, but it, it really, you know, the black press exploded this story. Is that not true, Richard? Correct. And I think that's one reason that, and also, I mean, it, it's, I mean, we're living through this right now. I mean, what a society is willing to put up with. Well, nothing I can do about that kind of thing. Um, so you've got to think about that. But I also think of media and think of who heard about it, who, you know, who was involved with the NASP, who was reading the African-American press, hundreds and thousands of people, but mostly African-Americans. So I think that that was part of it, not getting it, you know, getting attention, but not in a way that um, carried over. And I think historians, uh, you know, they, you look around if you don't see it. I mean, how Richard discovered this is really important um, because if it's not- You admit, you know, yeah, you had mentioned in, a, in an earlier conversation that we had, there was also no television. In other words, right. the, 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 the history that we know, like documentaries, like Eyes of the Prize, there's film. And right. this is really pre-television, this event, right? 
Very important point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, we, when we think civil rights, most of us, we have images from that period in our minds. Now, hopefully. Yeah, you know, police we'll dogs and so forth, yeah. right? I mean, right. Uh, yeah. So, so, Richard, your book and the film details, obviously, the remarkable courage and historical importance of Judge Wadey's wearing of Charleston. Um, some of them have described him as the father of Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, why has he until now been so little remembered and honored in South Carolina? Well, you know, we haven't had a lot of space for honoring heroes of the civil rights movement in South Carolina. I mean, let's be frank about that. And, um, and particularly, we, and, and generally that's true. And certainly courageous white resistors against Jim Crow have clearly not been honored. Uh, and um, Josh Waring wasn't the only one, there are others, um, but they were um, historically marginalized. And, you know, I think there's a lot of work has been done on trying to tell um, this story in a, in a fuller way. They're, um, um, Pat every day trains young historians to try to, to have them tell this story better and more completely. Um, there are a lot of stories out there. You know, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, let me tell you about this other incident of violence against a returning African-American soldier. Believe me, there are a lot of these incidents. Now, you know, it was a strange convergence of events that make the puts the spotlight on Isaac Woodard. I mean, usually the victims of racial mob violence are, um, are hanging at the end of a rope. They're dead. The movie makes that point. They're not here. And it wasn't just that Isaac Woodard survived. Um, he was pretty a pretty compelling speaker and witness. And, you know, we, we know in the Jewish community how important it is to witness horrific conduct. Never forget, right, to be witness because no one will witness for you if you don't. And so, I mean, part of what we're trying to do is recapture this history. Um, there was a period in which, I mean, there was a sort of a narrative about Southern history. And part of it was mentioned, you know, that there was this benign slave institution of slavery. And it wasn't really that bad that we, you know, brought, we Christianized um, um, these, these pagans. Well, you know, now studying discovered that a huge percentage of the uh, enslaved persons were, um, were um, had been converted to Catholicism or to, to Islam. They weren't godless people. Um, and many of them had their own ancient uh, religious traditions. Um, so, you know, part of this, and this is part of Judge Waring's awakening, when he starts sort of realizing that the, that the narrative is just completely false, it's not true, then where do you go? What do you do? How do you possibly, um, um, uh, how do you um, get to, what is the truth? And he and, and uh, Elizabeth Waring, uh, I loved um, my friend Sherilyn Eiffel talking about it. They had their own private seminar. I never quite thought of it that way, but that was a pretty good description. They, I mean, he would come home at night from the courthouse and she would read out loud to him because he was so tired. And then after about an hour of reading out loud, they would discuss what they had read. And they read these important controversial works, you know, out every night, day after day, week after week. And they had this awakening. And, you know, there are other Southerners who, I mean, I love reading about these Southern awakenings. Um, Dr. Sullivan has done this book on, on Virginia Durr. And Virginia Durr had her own moment of awakening, great civil rights leader in Alabama. And she grew up, you know, not really questioning things, kind of accepting things. And then she had this enlightenment. And Pat, that was what over the poll tax? Wasn't that the sort of when? Oh, the depression she, and then going to Washington. Yeah, yeah I depression. mean, she has this awakening. And um, and um, and so, you know, there's there is um, you know, a lot of a lot of folks on this, you know, Southerners who are listening here today grew up in an era in which there was school desegregation or there was beginning of the at the full-blown civil rights movement. But in 1940s, I mean, there was no space to talk about these subjects. There was just no place in the white community 
to talk about. And I do think we talked about this before we came online. There's a very big difference in talking about when you talk about the South or Charleston. There is a white Charleston that may ignore and not understand these issues. But there's an African-American Charleston. They get it. They know it. They know this story. I've had numerous African-Americans who very much know the story of Judge Waring and the story of, um, and, you know, it, 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 this is not a mystery to them. Um, you know, I, I tell this story that um, in the early part of the book in which I um, I read online that Julian Bond, the Georgia great Georgia civil rights leader, later the chairman of the board of the NAACP, he wrote a letter in which he said, the blinding of Isaac Woodard ignited the modern civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued. That was my thesis. So I called him up. I didn't know Julian Bond. I called him up and I told him I was working on this book. I had been doing this work on uh, uh, Wade is Waring and on Harry Truman. And I was wondering, was that what he was talking about, the effect on those? And he says, you know, Judge, I did. I, my dad knew Judge Waring very well. His father had been president of Lincoln University. He says, my dad knew Judge Waring very well. Um, and um, But that's not why I said it. And I knew as chairman of the NAACP, the history of Walter White telling the Isaac Woodard story to President Truman. I knew that story. But that's wasn't what I was talking about. I said, well, Mr. Bond, what were you talking about? He then began describing to me an image, a picture he remembered from his childhood. Um, it is the image that is the uh, open is the um, scene in this in the opening um, promo of this movie of the blinded Isaac Woodard. And as he began trying to describe to me this image he remembered from his childhood, he burst into tears. This is a man I'd never spoken to on the phone. He didn't know me, and you know there was this sort of you know embarrassing moment where he's weeping on the phone, and then he says. Judge, I please, please um, apologize for my emotion. He said, I'm surprising myself. He says, but I still, after 70 years, I still weep for that blinded soldier. He remembered from his childhood. We, you, you know, the thing in the movie that really touched me profoundly was Harry Truman's reaction. You know, you know, you know we all love Harry Truman because he recognized the state of Israel uh, Harry Truman, the controversial president in many ways, and, but Harry Truman, it seems like from what you said and what the film says, it just was as simple as that. Here's a soldier in a uniform who, who got his eyes gouged out, and he was just furious about it. Can you? Can you yeah, yeah, there's because definitely some political calculation in there initially. I mean, they're trying to encourage the African American vote in the major urban areas, which are very important. But at some point, he's getting a blowback from the South, and his political advisor is saying, "You know, we need to kind of cool our jets a little bit." And Harry Truman said, "I'm not backing up one step." He was a true. I mean, he had become a true convert to the cause. And, and, you know, he had a pretty progressive record as a senator from Missouri. Uh, African-American vote in Kansas City and St. Louis were very important. They were big. He, he had strong black support in all of his elections. And um, but, you know, it was a genuine surprise when he became this incredible advocate for civil rights. That speech that Jamila did, uh, recovered is just on the civil rights speech. It's a huge moment. Uh, you know, he says the national government must leave the way. Let me tell you, the national government was a bystander since end of Reconstruction. It was not leading the way. And, um, and then his action to desegregate the military is just this huge uh, moment. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned in the book this, this largely unknown story that after the, um, the, the president had pretty much implemented the desegregation of the military, 95% of African-American troops were in desegregated units. Um, the, the Department of Defense commissioned a study on the a secret study on the effect of efficiency of the desegregation and concluded it had no effect, no adverse effect on efficiency. And that report, which had remained secret at the time, was delivered nine copies to the members of the U.S. Supreme Court shortly before the Brown decision. I didn't know that. These stories all connect together. Robert, you're muted for some reason. 
How's that? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, better, yes. Okay. I don't know what happened. Um, but you, you wrote a book, but now we have a documentary film, and a film is a different way to tell history than a book. What can a film do in telling a story that is different, maybe even better than the written word in your well, Let me ask Pat Sullivan that first. She's written all these <laughs> wonderful books on civil rights history. Tell me, I've, watching that, that, vid, that wonderful documentary, I know there are things we can do in detail and in study and in depth, but tell me about your impression on the, on the, on the, on the use of a documentary film to tell an important moment of history. Well, when it's done the way Jamila and her team did it, um, as we said, you feel it, you know, you're there. I mean, it's the visual, it's the, it, it's, it, it consumes you. You know, I think the book is really important for understanding, you know, for really understanding the deeper background and, and, and the book is very powerful. I mean, it, but, but I think the visual, when it's well done, as it was so brilliantly done in this film, you feel it, you know, it, it, it's, as Robert said earlier about TV and the civil rights movement, you know, it, it's, um, you, it's just so powerful and, and, and human. And, um, and as a teacher, I must say, <laughs> my students, uh, undergraduates, they don't read whole books, you know, I mean, it, it's sort of, they, they're the visual generation. So I think it is such an asset. Um, your book, which has taught so many people about this, this film is going to just amplify that and bring it into places where the book would not probably go. So, but, but I do think it was just a powerful experience to be immersed in watching this film for, for two hours. Yeah, let, me just ask, let me just ask Jamila this, you know, um, you have this book with all those hundreds of footnotes I've done and all these packed in how do you discern it to, to tell a narrative over two hours? I mean, you could have done a 20 hour film, I suppose if we turned you loose. I have, um, I don't recommend that though. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody would listen. <laughs> Nobody would watch to the end. You know, I think what, what's particularly challenging about adapting your book is that usually you have a, a, a central character who you follow from beginning to end. And in this case, there's really sort of three characters who we have to pass the baton back and forth to. Um, so that was, you know, a lot of a lot of the work of sort of figuring out what do we keep in, how much detail can we go into, had a lot to do with just figuring out how is it, how to make it watchable as we make these transitions, as we blend these stories together. Um, and, and sort of to tie these sort of disparate threads. Um, so, so part of it, I mean, we started with a film that was much too long and had to keep whittling it down and whittling it down and whittling it down, but it really, it came down to sort of a feeling of what is moving us through the story, because it's quite a long chunk of history that we're telling and letting us know each of these characters and telling us what we need to know and also isn't sort of losing us and you know feeling like we're sort of starting the movie over again every 10 minutes so it was it was there was a lot more um once we decided what what, what parts of the story we had to tell it was really it really came down to just crafting it and feeling feeling it out when how the transitions were working how it moved of course, you had the benefit. You know, we were talking about the impact of media of, of using the, uh, the documentary film. You opened the film with maybe the greatest radio personality in radio history, right? Uh, Orson Welles. I mean, he's the guy who did the War of the Worlds. Everybody thought the Martians were invading us, right? I mean, he's like twenty-three years old when that happens. Uh, he's this extraordinary talent on the radio, and you. I mean, what a blessing. I know when we were on a media call, you and I, um, several of the media folks said, how did you find Orson Welles? I mean, good right. God. Uh, and then um, tell them about finding the um, the film at the end, because that wasn't just like low-lying fruit. The, and I'm talking about the video of Isaac Woodard. Well, yeah, I mean, you're always, the, the other challenge is you're sort of, because you are making something so visual, you are somewhat beholden to what you can 
represent on screen. And so in this case in, of this film, we, there was actually a lot that was missing. All, all the courtroom scenes, we didn't really have material for. All the, the attack of Isaac Woodard, we didn't have material for. We didn't have, we couldn't find a single picture of Isaac Woodard before his attack. Um, so it was, it was really important to me that we sort of bring these we, we bring to mind these events and, and sort of got a little creative about how we did that. But uh, actually, I have to thank you, Judge Gurgle. You made me aware that this footage of Isaac Woodard from the 1980s existed. And you said you, you couldn't find it and you really tried. And um, so I knew it existed. And that's like the best lead you can have is to know that something exists. I think we just, I know you never found it, but I think we had the luxury of time because by the time I started looking for it, the collection, the Gil Noble collection had been turned over to someone at the Schomburg Center who found it for us just with with relative ease. <laughs> and, you know, and I had earlier asked for it and it had not arrived apparently, or they, nobody, I asked about whether they had it. They said they didn't, but you know, these things happen over time. I probably asked about it three or four years earlier, you know, yeah. so. Uh, um, but it came, well, in, it came in at the well, very well, end. Lily, are you getting any questions from anyone? Yes, yes, we have quite a few. Um, right. There are several that relate to Judge Waring. And we'll start, I uh, guess, uh, Judge uh, Gurgle, and you can just, uh, send these out to whom. A couple of questions are, are one that you've already answered. Isn't the, is there a, a monument or a memorial to him anywhere in the Charleston area? And I think the answer to that is no. No, there is. There is. Oh, there there is. is. There's, a statue. Built it. There's a statue <laughs> on the court, federal courthouse grounds to Judge Waring. And in 2016, on the, uh, with the initiation of Senator Hollings, he had his name oh. removed from our federal courthouse. And the courthouse was renamed the Jay Waitis Waring Federal Judicial Center. Uh, let me it say that, literally an act of Congress. And, and uh, Richard, let me remind you, in the early 2000s, Joe Riley put up a small bust of, of Judge Waring up in City Hall Chambers. I mean, this is 20 years ago and said it's time to bring him home. So, you know, and then you had it up a committee or you had lawyers heading up a committee to build a monument to Waring. Robert was on that committee. So, I mean, yeah, we, we've, uh, in, in the bar in Charleston raised the money. It was over $100,000 to uh, erect this beautiful statue, which is in our garden here at, uh, at the federal courthouse. And Fritz Hollings, Fritz Hollings did the unthinkable. He said, you can take my name off at a building and put what he's wearing. Because he off. deserved it more. Because he deserved yeah. it more. Yeah. Who, who and, would do and, that? And why did he do that? What was Fritz Hollings' uh, motivation for that? Fritz told me that, and, and I was very involved in this. He, he, he said that he had always planned at the right moment to get the no courthouse named for Judge Waring. He just had to wait for the right moment. One day he came into his Senate office and his staff said last evening, Senator Thurman had put a bill in and it had passed that had um, named a lake in the upstate for Senator Thurman and it named the courthouse for him. And it, just, it has happened. And he said, I've been always, you know, I always didn't feel it was right. And I said, well, you know, he says, I want to take the name off and I want to put Judge Waring's name on. <laughs> well, the judges don't make that decision. Uh, Congress does. And eventually, Fritz, a retired U.S. Senator, went to the congressional delegation. And um, Congress literally changed the name. It was the first time in American history. And I remember... Um, um, you know, we, we honored Senator Hollings, um, and, uh, and there's a statute next to Judge Waring to Senator Hollings now, and, um, and his dear friend from the Senate, Joe Biden, came down for it and uh, heard the whole story, and then several years later, um, uh, for, then former Vice President Biden came to Charleston to, um, to give Fritz's eulogy, and he told the story. Of the name change, uh, that was the eulogy, and um, Mr. Biden leaned over to me afterwards and said, "Did I get it right?" And I said, "You got every word of it right." <laughs> um, what do you think about Judge Waring's thoughts about the impact that his wife had 
on him. You had mentioned the little seminars and they studied. Would he have come to this conclusion without the help of his wife? Well, his wife had no um, more interest in this subject than he did. They experienced together this horrific trial. They were shocked together and they made this journey together. So, you know, it's a little hard to imagine the same impact with his first wife. Um, uh, so, you know, I think she's a very important figure. Um, Charles, many Charlestonians tried to write off Judge Waring as being that this whole, um, all these civil rights cases were a form of racial revenge he was getting for the city for not having accepted his second wife, which was just nonsense. But she is an important player in this. And they travel this journey together. I hope, I, I think the film captured that. I certainly talked about it a good bit in, in, in my book. Um, she, so she's a very important, um, she's a very important character in this. Um, uh, but, you know, Judge, she's not a lawyer. Judge Waring is the lawyer. He's the one who conceives the concept, not to get too technical, the sort of so-called per se rule that all segregation is per se unconstitutional, which had not been the law. The law had been separate but equal. It's okay to be segregated if it's equal. Well, this sub per, se, per se rule then is adopted by the Supreme Court in Brown. It becomes Brown. It, the origin of that is way to swear. Okay, we're going to switch now to um, Isaac a little bit. Um, there's been a couple of questions. Do you think that he um, ever realized the importance of his tragic uh, attack that it had, uh, not so much at the moment, but as, as he got older and, and grew older? Did he? L did Lily, he, he never knew that? it. This is one of the tragedies of this story. Uh, is when I went to the family and met the family, Robert Young, who was just so wonderful. Uh, Jamil, I'm sure you just loved interviewing Mr. Young. He's just a great person. Uh, and when I came to know him and told him this, he was asking me to send him all the materials. He was like amazed. I mean, this is the guy who was, the, was his uncle's caregiver. He loved his uncle. He was completely devoted to him, but he was utterly shocked by this role. And he said, my uncle never had a clue. Hmm. And do you know, was there any South Carolina governor that ever pardoned Isaac Woodard? Uh, no, but the town of Batesburg, bless their hearts, when they learned this story really from me, the town attorney went into court and overturned his unjust conviction. That's just in the last two years or so. This uh, next question um, sort of looks at the broader picture. You know, in the film, it, it very well uh, specifies that the Jim Crow era began probably with this incident. Um, what do you think is happening now with what's going on in the world? Are we returning back to a, a Jim Crow time? Um, I'll leave, I'm going I'm to I'm def deflect that question to others. I'll, you know, I, I, I always I, have to... I always have to say this when we have our program. Richard's a sitting federal judge. He has no opinions. He has no political opinions whatsoever. Uh, actually, I think Jamela could probably answer this in terms of what her thoughts are. Of whether we're returning to, to a Jim Crow era? Yes. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> All I can tell you is that, that voter... Uh, sort of voter suppression tactics. Um, they're, they're familiar and they certainly harken back to this day. Um, you know, I think they're done in a response to, to black franchisement, to black people participating in the political process more than they ever have before. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would like to think that that sort of robust uh, participation that we've seen from from people of color in the last elections will make it sort of easier to get through this latest round of, of voter suppression tactics. But um, all I can really say is that it certainly feels familiar. Um, Judge Gurgle, have you received much response from other federal judges uh, uh, since your book has come out? 
Yeah, it, it's really, um, I've done a lot of speaking around the country and uh, I go to judges when judges ask me to show up. You know, we haven't met much during the pandemic, but prior to that, I've traveled around the country. I've spoken to a number of groups. I have many speeches set for 2022 to, um, to federal judges and the response has been incredibly warm. Um, uh, it's just been, um, there's a lot of pride in Judge Waring. Um, you know, I keep trying to remind people, you know, I'm not the one who was courageous. I'm not the one who showed unexampled courage. I, I told the story, but it was these participants who showed unexampled courage. But yeah, my, my colleagues have a great pride um, over the legacy of Judge Waring. Well, that concludes the questions that I've um, received through the chat. Um, Judge Gergel, I turn it back to you um, uh, or um, any of the other uh, guests, if you'd like to have a, a uh, parting message to this fine group of- uh, we can, can I just give a shout out to Pat Sullivan's book on Bobby Kennedy? It's coming out. This is <laughs> gonna be a very important book. Pat, just tell us briefly about it, if you would, because I think our audience would be very interested in this book. Um, Thanks, uh, Richard. I didn't start out writing a book about Robert Kennedy. I wanted to understand the 60s in a more interesting way, not just civil rights, black power, but moving through the 60s around the struggle over racial justice and civil rights. And he sort of was there. And so he became my lens. But I think it goes back to that earlier question, you know, what happened and what Richard, again, I, the film, you know, has a certain feeling, but I think the film is going to bring people to the book. You know, because they, people are going to want to know more, and and this history that that's been documented captures a pivotal moment in our civil rights struggle and our racial justice struggle. But each generation, you know, it's a long time from Isaac Woodard to Brown when it's actually decided. Massive resistance when nothing changes. The sit-ins. So I think as we look through history, you know, th there's no origin starts at there. Are, people who move to the front and really energize this effort in our country, which is ongoing. And I think Robert Kennedy, I was surprised by him because I never really, I thought, oh, well, that was, you know, but historians have not really looked at him closely in relationship. I mean, I guess if you study African-American history, you start to look at America differently and you ask different kinds of questions. And that's what I did. And I, and I spent the, I spent the pandemic finishing my book on Kennedy and I hope you know you'll you'll read it um, because I learned so much, and it really is part of this this story that we continue to live and and that continues to challenge us as Americans. So thanks, Richard. And I love the cover. That cover is taken in Mississippi in 1966 um, when he went down to kind of be exposed to the poverty and and really be with children in those communities. Lily, I have a question for Richard. Um, has the International African American Museum reached out to you about Isaac Woodard? Uh, it has not uh, directly, but you know a number of the folks. Um, um, you know, I'm friends with folks active with the museum, and and I'm confident at some point they're mostly trying to build the building right now. But I'm confident they're going to uh, they're going to want to honor the the Briggs plaintiffs and the story of Judge Waring. I'm 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 confident that will be that that story will be told. Yeah, I I think the thing that I got out of the film that you know first of all I think reading a book is sort of an intellectual exercise, and um, it, it there's some emotion that comes along with it. But the film seeing seeing the families and what they went through. And that, that segment where um, Marshall sends down his assistant lawyer with Carter. Robert tell, Carter. Yep. Yeah, to say, look, this is gonna get really dangerous. You know, y'all can withdraw. And they all unanimously say they're not going anywhere. I mean, it's very powerful. And um, I, I know our audience, um, are probably most of everybody's on this broadcast for South Carolinians and, the, you know, I felt ashamed about the state, you know, when I when I saw it. I mean, it was a very powerful film, and um, it just uh, it's it's a bad it's a bad story about South Carolina. So, but, but it's but a good it, story about South Carolina. Yeah, there's plenty it, of heroic South Carolinians. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But you know, it's we went through a lot. 
Um, and it's a story that's got to be told, got to be told. And I think that's the takeaway message, good, bad, yeah. or, or ugly. It's the story that has to be told. Yeah. And we know lots of stories like this that are uh, shameful, that should never have occurred, but uh, they have. And, and all we can do is continue to teach our students, uh, teach our teachers, and to learn ourselves right from wrong and um, the difference between good and evil. And I think that that mm -hmm. is how we all have to strive to go forward. I wanna thank our guests so much for tonight. I think it was a wonderful, wonderful ending to uh, an event that we started last night when we saw the, the movie. Jamela, you deserve a lot of credit for bringing that to the screen and bringing it alive. Um, Pat, a uh, credit for the historical accuracy and background that's there. And of course, dear Richard, for <laughs> putting this um, front and center so that we are all now very much aware of something that um, happened after World War II, another horrific event. Um, and, and we're just now sinking our teeth into that. And, and let's see how it plays out in 2021. We've got um, we've got a, a, a policeman who killed another Af who killed an African American. We've got uh, over 40 states that are um, trying to restrict voting rights of, of our citizens, and we've got um, lots of things to work on. So let this be a platform from which we can all move forward, and hopefully can see. Uh, how to move forward in a more positive direction. Lily, could you briefly mention our next program? Yes, I'm getting ready to do so. You read my, you read my mind. <laughs> um, tonight's program is recorded and y'all can pick it up uh, again, if you'd like to on Facebook. Uh, all, of our, all of our programs are recorded. Our next program will be Sunday on April the 18th. And it is uh, within the commemoration week of the Days of Remembrance. Uh, it's called Rebirth, South Carolina's Holocaust Families. And we will have as guests, Anita Zucker, who is on this program. Anita, you can wave your hand. Uh, <laughs> David Papowski, who is also, <laughs> he just turned around. Okay. Oh, there he is. He came into the other room, David Papowski. I will be on there as a guest. And David Rothberg is going to be on there as well. Um, Judge Gurgle and Attorney Rosen will be the, the conversationalist. <laughs> During that entire program, I have to yield my position uh, back to have uh, Gurgle as co moderator. There you go. You both will be there. And we urge everybody to become members of the society. Go to the Jewish um, Historical Society of South Carolina.org. Um, see what our programming has been, see what it is, and see where it's going in the future. I think you'll be pleased. We invite you as guests. And with that, I'll end our program. Wish you all to stay well, keep yourself safe during COVID, and we hope to see you again in April. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.